Listening to podcasts is no replacement for real training. While we attempt to provide accurate commentary, we hold no responsibility on how you use the information we provide. Get medical training. In the blink of an eye, every day order can be replaced with once in a lifetime chaos. Be prepared. This is the Civilian Medical Podcast. All right. Welcome to Civilian Medical Podcast, episode 24. I'm here with my good buddy, Skinny Medic. How's it going, man? Good. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. Having fun. Um, the topic of today's show is going to be one that we actually got some questions in. Was it the Facebook page? Yeah, I believe it was the Facebook page. We recently did kind of, you know, we talked about some wilderness medicine and it kind of i guess opened up a can of worms with some more questions so we thought we would just make another episode out of it and kind of cover some of those questions that were asked all right i love it so common wilderness emergencies you know it's funny i was just talking about snakes today and i think that's where we should start it off you know snake bites right so what i just take my pocket knife i cut it open i suck out the venom spit it on the ground we all end up fat and happy and we're good to go or kind of um <laughs> So I generally say that I don't care what she looks like. I'm not sucking the poison out um, unless like Ivanka Trump walks in and says she got spit on her butt. Then I'm like, oh, I'll suck the poison <laughs> out. But, um, you know, typically that's not the best thing. And like, I hate snakes. Like, I don't like snakes. I don't want to get bit by a snake. Um, I don't like anything that I can't predict. Like, I can predict that a dog is getting ready to bite me. And I'm okay. But like. I guess there are warning signs for the snake, but typically there's not. Like they just want to like hurt, like they just want to bite you. I'm like this is not cool. Um, agreed. Actually, so funny story. I, I've been historically afraid of snakes my whole life, and uh, you know, a few years ago, I was like, okay, I'm a grown ass man. I, I should not be afraid of snakes. So a buddy of mine is an amateur herpetologist, which basically just means he goes out in the country and uh, catches and catalogs snakes and and does all kinds of stuff like that. And uh, I was like, you know, I, I kind of want to go with you. So let's uh let's go one day so we go out and we're out in the middle of nowhere and he's telling me the story about how he'd been bitten by a rattlesnake and then we we ended up catching rattlesnakes all day long and he's like if if i get bit i'll probably die just because i've been bit by him a, a couple times and i'm on blood thinners so i'm like okay well we're in the middle of nowhere maybe if we just didn't catch any that would be great but no the whole day he, he's catching them so i went out to actually get over my fear of snakes and came away kind of a little bit more scared of snakes because I was so nerve wracked all day because I didn't want him to get bit and me have to drive him back to the uh, civilization. It was it was crazy. Are you still there? Oh, hold on, sorry. I don't know if it's, is it my connection. I don't know. Maybe. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you now. Okay, cool. Sorry. Oh no, no problem. Uh, let's see. Three thirty. Cut that out. So yeah, that was that was my experience with snakes. It was it was pretty nuts. Um, but yeah, I try to stay away from them generally. Yeah, like I know there's good snakes out there, and um, from what my limited knowledge of snakes, and like I said, I know just enough to be dangerous about them, is that the adult snakes are pretty tame. Like even majority of their bites are dry bites. So your poison snakes, your large snakes are are the dry bites. It's the baby snakes that are kind of uh pissy with you because they haven't quite figured out how to control their venom uh so and they're they can be just as dangerous as far as potency as the big snakes so you know the baby snakes people think they're all just little babies and not they're not very harmful but it, they can be very dangerous yeah for sure the baby snakes actually kind of freak me out a little bit because they're crazy they just start striking at anything a shadow gets near them they strike at it yeah so some of the, like I hear about tourniquets and things like that uh, with snake bites, and that's kind of, kind of a misconception that you don't want to do that. Um, there are inherent risks. Like I like tourniquets just as much as anybody, uh, but you don't want to do that. You don't want to put a tourniquet on a snake bite because there are inherent risks with that. You, know, you can get paralysis, things uh, get messed up with that. So what we typically tell people to do is a couple of different things you can look at is one, you treat it like a fracture so you can splint it. Uh, with, you know, maybe it's a makeshift splint. Maybe you have a same splint, something like that. Uh, but you may have to make a splint and an improvised splint out of uh, tree limbs or a piece of wood. Uh, if you're going to use a piece of wood, then um, I would you know, make it, try to put some padding in there, like use a shirt or something like that, and then splint it in place. So you want to splint before and after the joints uh, to kind of hold, 
everything in place. If you don't have the ability to do that, then you could just use a pressure bandage. Like you could use an Israeli pressure bandage or something like that and wrap it to keep it uh, kind of controlled. What's the what's the purpose behind splinting this? You're trying to uh, prevent the the poison from moving as rapidly as possible. So that kind of helps hold it in place, uh, the tissue from moving and things like that to kind of uh, so it doesn't spread as far. Interesting. And a pressure bandage, you put that over the point of entry or the bite? Definitely. And like I said, knowing that like I would take a look at this, especially if you're way out in the woods, you know, you want to try to keep the patient calm because now if they're freaking out that they've gotten bit by a snake and that's going to jack their heart rate up and things like that, which is going to spread the poison further. So you know, before I just immediately start wrapping up, I would take a look at it and kind of see what's going on there and kind of evaluate it, see if there's any kind of swelling. Uh, infection is kind of things we need to look at for long term with these snake bites. But, you know, don't f immediately freak out and think because you got a snake bite, you're going to die. Um, maybe. I mean, depending on what kind of nasty snake it is. But, you know, at least try to keep the patient calm as much as possible before you try, try and get them to help. Yeah, for sure. I was actually reading somewhere not too long ago. Maybe I was talking to my friend, the herpetologist, and he said that uh, when, the last time he got bitten, they didn't even give him any antivenin. That uh, apparently it's like super, super expensive. And depending on how they're reacting to it, they either will or, or may not even give it. And especially a lot of places, a lot of hospitals don't even have it because of the cost. Yeah, for us, you know, like in my area, there's one hospital that has it. And we have, gosh, probably eight to 10 hospitals within like, helicopter ride distance um and there's only one hospital that really has good antivenom so it is it's super expensive and it's kind of snake dependent like there's things for coral snakes pit vipers so you kind of have to know what type of snake you got bit by and kind of uh you know do not bring the snake to the hospital like let's <laughs> just like we'll pause right there like what pops in my head like don't bring a pit viper a coral snake something like that it's like drop it at the nurse's desk going this snake just bit me. I got uh, bit by this and now you did too. Yes. You will see some nurses freak out. Uh, you will see some paramedics freak out if you like call them and say, hey, and you slide this big pit viper in the back of their ambulance. Go, hey, I think this thing just bit me. Uh, um, yeah. But at least have an idea. Maybe you can describe it. Um, was it colorful? Was it you know black, brown? You know What kind of, you know, was it rattling? Obviously, things like that. So because those are pretty the antivenoms, you know, then you know what kind of snake goes. I was reading a while back about some antivenom that was universal and Miami Dade hospital has it. Uh, and it's pretty expensive there in, in there and you need two doses. So I'm like, that guy's pretty smart. You come up with something that's universal. It's expensive. And Oh yeah. And by the way, you gotta have to do two doses of it. You gotta have twice. Uh, so the big dangers there, like Infection, like you mentioned, tissue necrosis or tissues like just dying around uh, around the bite, and then yep. in the related infections. What's the what, what's the kind of immediate? Uh, and have you ever actually run any calls for snake bites? I've run a couple uh, snake bites. Nothing too crazy. Um, nothing um, that was like it's like water moccasins and stuff like that. Like nothing. Um, I've never run like a pit viper, or anything like that. Uh, rattlesnake. Nothing. But the immediate danger, obviously, is the, unfortunately, there's nothing much we can do pre-hospital. Nothing much. Can I say that? Like, does that make sense? Um, yeah. <laughs> that you can do pre-hospital, like, in the field. So that's why you just kind of hold it in place. Like, there's no medicine we can give them. You pull out your first aid kit. Like, oh, I'm giving you an EpiPen. Like, that doesn't really work for this. Yeah. It doesn't work at all for this. Uh, but, you know, so we got to get them to the hospital. And I think that's the kind of thing is, you know, try to keep, keep them calm, keep them relaxed, and uh, get them to the hospital. All right, there you go. Now, next up, so I, I'll I'll be perfectly honest. A couple minutes ago, you started talking about splints, and I was like, "Wait a minute, did we change topics?" And I didn't notice because next topic is actually fractures. Yeah, I kind of when we were putting our notes together, I kind of like cut those together because I was like, "I know we talk about fractures," and then I was like, "Well, if we're going to talk about splinting, that kind of flows right into there." And you know, like, and I'll put fractures, and we could even put like slash dislocations there because it's kind of the same thing uh, as far as what we're thinking about. Um, you know, I'm sure our listeners know I, I still, I work pretty good with a, um, uh, search and rescue team here locally. And so that's what we do a lot. Like it seems like every weekend I'm on the mountain getting someone who's got a dislocated ankle. Um, maybe it's a leg, things like that. A lot of leg injuries that we go up and we hike and we get to them for, and no one's prepared for that. No one's prepared for, Oh, I stepped off a rock wrong and I twisted my ankle and it rolled. Like no one's, no one's there for that. So, uh, thinking about having, um, 
you know, things we're still there. Yeah. You cut off for a second. Uh, thinking about things. So we're, I'll pause. So we probably need to think about things that we're going to have with us. Maybe it's like a handkerchief, a bandana. Uh, maybe you have a triangle bandage. You're probably not going to carry a Sam splint with you on this. So they're again, improvising medicine, taking tree branches, branches, uh, maybe using a t-shirt, maybe using a triangle bandage, things like that to kind of improvise a fracture. And so like a, a swing, a sling and swath looks really good for that. Uh, like an upper shoulder, upper arm, the hip can be kind of, a, you know, that's if someone falls, breaks a hip, that's, that's a troubling, uh, because there's no easy way to splint that uh, doing improvised medicine, but legs, you know, if you've got an ankle, you need to try to control the knee uh, with that. So if you've got someone who's twisted the ankle, I'd go ahead and try to splint the ankle and the knee to help prevent moving it. Um, and then you come up you know, the wrist. If you're going to control the elbow, if you've got a shoulder injury. I'm going to control the elbow and the shoulder. And you're doing that for a couple of things is one for pain management. Uh, if someone's got to move and get them off the mountain, then we want to uh i'm gonna cut my camera off and see okay cool sorry about that oh it's not. are you back yeah i think i'm there okay cool sorry i don't know what's going on yeah no problem so the reason why we're splitting these fractures is because we want to uh, think about pain management. You know, we start moving them, trying to get them off the mountain, then that can be very painful. So uh, limited movements can help with pain. Also to control internal bleeding, because you can get some bleeding internally. You know, with an arm or a leg, you can get uh, a few hundred uh, cc's of blood loss. With a femur fracture, you can get like 1,500 cc's of blood loss. So you can bleed a good bit internally from these injuries. So we want to try to splint those. And Try not to uh, put them in place. We don't really try to do that uh, unless it's just something grossly, but, you know, we just kind of make it look normal. And that's when I talk to my students about, you know, how to splint something. I'm like, all right, make it look normal. And you're probably going to, the patient's probably going to splint it on their own anyway, because if you break your arm, you're going to immediately grab it to your torso, to your body and hold it. If you know, you've got your leg and you're going to immediately grab it. So, you know, make it look normal. Um, make it feel comfortable for the patient. There's going to be some swelling there and that's the body's natural way of splinting it. So we're okay there and uh, make it uh, comfortable for the patient. And if you have some ice packs or you've got an, some ice that you can put on it, try not to put the ice directly on top of the wound, uh, but you can put maybe like a shirt, kind of a barrier so it doesn't get super cold on them. But even ice pack stuff like that would be good for this. All right. Awesome. Uh, next up, cuts. Yeah, so typically these cuts, you know, we don't think about life-threatening cuts, uh, but we still want to keep them clean. And, you know, maybe they may affect us getting off the trail or getting out of the woods where deer hunting, things like that. So we want to carry some basic banishing supplies, maybe it's like some 4x4, some 5x9s, some clean, things like that. So we can make it comfortable for us so we can get out of the woods timely. You know, maybe it's just a cut on your leg but you're sweating, it's going to part running down your leg. And so you're just trying to bandage it to keep it clean so you can able to get it out, get out of the woods. And you're not going to need a, hopefully you don't need a tourniquet for something like this, but you should have a tourniquet on you, especially if you're a hunter, uh, you should have something like that with you. But you know, maybe you just have some basic bandaging supplies to make the bleeding not as, not as a pain in the butt, honestly, so you can get out of the woods. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, get the bleeding stopped and get the heck out of there. Uh, let's see. And once we get out of the woods, we can clean it, things like that. But you know, basically, like you see, a lot of people get cut on the arms or legs, and they're bleeding. It doesn't. It's not like a huge deal, but then they need. Um, it's just more difficult for them to get out because they've got blood running into their socks, their shoes, things like that. So if you can just keep it the mild bleeding under control, it makes it better. Yeah. This is one that I always wonder about, and I think there's a lot of uh, old wives' tales and just urban myths and things like that, and that's hypothermia. Definitely. Um, I think you probably deal with this more so than out in your area of the country than where I do. Um, and we, we do get some cold weather here in South Carolina, but it's not that big of a deal. Um, but you probably out there probably get some more snow, some car, a little bit colder weather out there. 
but hypothermia is it's a big deal. Uh, you can get some patients that um, mild hypothermia, we start shivering, and that's your body's natural way of starting to warm itself up. And then you know when you stop shivering and your your body's trying to keep itself warm. And the problem with hypothermia is is once you start going hypothermic, man, it is difficult with basic supplies to get that coming back the other way. Yeah. I mean, like what even can you do? Because, I mean, we all carry space blankets, but that's not going to be enough. So for me, like this kind of gets off the medical side, but you should have at least two ways of starting fire. When you're hiking, when you're in the woods, when you're deer hunting or you're uh, whatever else. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And two ways, just in case the first one fails. Exactly. You know, that way if one, one, you know, the striker you're using doesn't work, then I carry a lighter. So that way I can start a fire and get myself close to the fire to start warming, warming myself up. If you've been submerged in water or you've gotten wet, then those clothes need to come off. I know it may be uncomfortable for you uh, because you're soaking wet now, but you got to get those wet clothes off. You can hang those up by the fire, get them dry, and you're going to go bare skin, get the survival blanket around you, and get next to the fire and start trying to warm yourself back up. Yeah, I've seen that on Bear Grylls. Yeah, it's not like Brokeback Mountain. It's a little different than that, but uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, get the wet clothes off if possible. Get them dry and get yourself by a fire, whatever it happens to be. Try to stay off the ground as much as possible because it'll suck the heat out of you. And uh, yeah, just fire. Uh, that's pretty much the key, especially up in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, I mean, like you said, building your bed with leaves, things like that. You don't want to be on the bare ground. You don't, even concrete, you know, like a more urban environment. So concrete will... Uh, just suck the suck the heat right out of you. Yeah, for sure. Uh, frostbite. So yeah, this can happen as well. Um, you know, your feet get wet, you get cold, and one of the things with frostbite is you want to try to warm it up, like gradually warm it up. Maybe some warm water, uh, maybe by the fire, things like that. Unless there's a chance it could get refrozen again. If there's a chance that it can refreeze again, then you just want to leave it and you're going to splint it like it was a fracture. Like you, if you had some frostbite on your feet or your toes, then you would splint that like it was like you'd broken your ankle or your dislocated your ankle and you would not want to thaw it out. If there was a chance when you kind of spend the night in the woods, you're like, there's a chance this may freeze again. So if there's no chance it's going to, you're, it's going to freeze back again. Then we can gradually start to warm it up using some lukewarm water, uh, changing it out very often because if you put a cold object in water, it's going to cool back down. So that's a problem. Uh, but having some lukewarm water, you can change out and keep it warm and start uh, thawing it back out. But these look pretty nasty. I mean, they can be almost be like burns. You can have, you know, some, they kind of categorize them as first, second, third degree frostbite. You know, you get the first degrees, there's kind of some redness, it looks kind of like a burn, like a first degree burn, like we're typically seeing. Mm -hmm. And then you can go all the way to their swelling and it looks like a nasty third degree burn. And it's just that degree of frostbite going on. Yeah. Yeah. That, that one freaks me out. I always wear two pairs of socks when I'm out training in the, in the winter time. Yep. I always have a, a spare set. You know, if I think there's a chance my feet are getting wet, I, I'll, I'll, I'll change them out. Yeah, definitely. Uh, dehydration. Yeah, so this is one of those things that happens a lot, uh, especially where people are unprepared. Uh, maybe they're going out training, they're hiking, and they're not hydrating before. People don't typically think about that. You know, it's two days out before they're getting ready to go do a big hike, or they're going to a big hunt, or they're just outside training, and they're not hydrating then. So, uh, you know, if you're two days out from your hike, you're going in the woods, you should be hydrating like crazy. And we do not drink enough water, typically. Uh, I don't drink enough water. My wife fusses at me, but, um, you know, that's, you should be well hydrated. And so think about if you start realizing that you're getting those muscle cramps, those heat cramps, and you, you've stopped peeing, uh, your pee is bright yellow, it smells bad. Uh, that's a problem. You know, you should uh, be peeing uh, quite often. And so thinking about maybe like a water filter, obviously take more water than you anticipate you're going to need. Uh, plan for that. And then I always take a water filter with me. Uh, like the life straw is in there. That way, if I can find a source of uh, water, then I can start drinking it and filter my own water. Because you don't want to drink just 
well, maybe you could drink creek water out there, but like I don't drink creek water here because we have cows and stuff. And like, I don't want to be up downstream from a cow that's pooping yeah. and peeing and pigs and all this other stuff. So maybe the rivers are nice and cleaner than on Colorado, but they are. That's where we get Coors Light directly out of the river. Yes, I've, I've seen the commercial. That's <laughs> oh, that's Bush. Sorry, never mind. That's a different. Uh, but, same, same difference. Same difference. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, just uh, thinking about uh, carrying more water than you think you're going to need. And then carry up some kind of filtration system. That way, if you do start to get low on water, you can rehydrate. Yeah. The Gatorade and other stuff, like that stuff is okay, but it's full of sugars. And we actually need that, but not so much as much as they put in there. So if you can cut that stuff in half is typically what I tell people. Or, or if you're going to drink a bottle of Gatorade, back it up by a bottle of water and kind of switch those back and forth. Yeah. And so much sodium too. Uh in uh, Gatorades and whatnot. So there's just all kinds of stuff there. And uh, dehydration, I've always kind of been like, if I'm going to be out, you know, shooting all day in the sun and heat tomorrow, that I'd really need to hydrate today because, I mean, uh, yeah, you're hydrating tomorrow when you're out there, but if you're dehydrated when you get there, you're dehydrated and you're kind of fighting from, from back a ways already. You've already lost that fight, right? Exactly. And this is, our, again, another situation where it's easier to be proactive with this dehydration and the time you start getting like your, you can, you can look in someone's mouth and say, look, let me see your tongue. And their tongue should look nice and wet. We can say moist. Uh, that's a nice word. I love that word. Moist. <laughs> moist. Like their tongue and mouth should be moist. And if it's not, they're dehydrated. So they guys are drinking water. So the mouth looking at that, ask them like, I get personal. Like when's the last time you peed? Okay. Was it clear or was it yellow? Oh, it was probably bright yellow. Okay. Start drinking, get in the shade, uh, take some of the tight i was just kind of, kind of flowing into heat related but it's all right well we're just the next topic but yeah you get them into the shade uh get them the the clothing kind of loosened off of them things like that and get them rehydrated yeah 100 percent. and this is this is one that i battle with constantly because i do not drink enough water i try uh but i i fail often and we're out filming at least once a week in the you know between 85 100 degree weather and uh, we're super close to the sun here in Colorado, too. So <laughs> it, it, it's even worse. I mean, we get sunburned in 15 minutes. Uh, so, yeah, hydration is it's a battle. And then even when I was in Missouri, uh, I saw people kind of dropping like flies because of dehydration and heat related stuff, which is what we're going to talk about now. Yeah. And like I admit too, like I, I drink a lot of coffee. I'm a coffee addict. And so Same. I tell Candace there's water in coffee, but she doesn't really agree with that. Um but still, like we get a, we'll be sitting around on an afternoon and also boom, we get called out for a hike. I'm like, crap. So I start chugging water, like just down in it. And I'm like, all right, before we get on the trail, I got to pee real quick. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, but yeah. So I try to get that, but I'm just as guilty as everyone else with it too. Yeah. It, it, it's a tough one. I struggle with that more than anything else is making sure that I stay, stay hydrated because I know what a battle it is. Like once you start to get dehydrated, you get headaches and you just feel awful and um, yeah, so I try, I try to hydrate as often as possible, especially if I know I'm going to be out training or working or whatever else in the, in the heat and sun. Yep. Just taking breaks, you know, taking that, you know, every 45 minutes, an hour, just to kind of just take a break, chill, hydrate, and then get back started with it. Yep. hundred percent agree. So heat related stuff like, uh, there's heat cramps, heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Let's talk about, Hey, what are the differences between those? What causes them? What are the symptoms and how do we help? Yeah, so that kind of, we start from the very beginning, like you start getting cramped up and you can feel it maybe in your, your calf muscles or your legs, or maybe your fingers, your hands, you start feeling those cramps, like the muscle cramps, like the muscle tightness. And that is the sodium potassium problem. You know, we're just losing so much of the both of those uh, at the cellular level that that's where the cramping is just starting. So that's where, that's why, you know, the the they put the sodium and things like that into the Gatorades and try to get that re replenished. But it's just, it's a lot on your stomach most times, but you know, those, you can start feeling the crampings and like, that's the early stage. So you, at that point, you need to stop, you know, get in the shade. Uh, if you've got some clothing that's kind of tight, you need to pull that off. And uh, maybe um, if you've got some water you can put on you, then start putting water on you, put a fan in front of you. When you're sweating, that's the body's natural way of cooling itself down because the wind's blowing, the air's moving across the skin. It's, uh, moist from the uh, sweat and you start to cool cool down so 
if you have a way of doing that artificially, then yes, we should put water on them. Maybe put ice packs, start cooling them down. Um, some of the high schools here and even the universities are also doing it. They'll put like like buckets, like uh, bathing, not bathing, like um, like the bath troughs for like on a farm. They fill them up full of ice water. So if these kids start cramping up the least, they throw them in this ice bath and leave them in there until they're good. And then they drag them back out. Um, so we put up on a couple of uh, kids that, you know, maybe they're starting to get overheated. They're starting going into that maybe from heat cramps to heat exhaustion. And the trainer has just dunked them in mice to get their core temperature back down. I like it. That, that probably sucks for the kid, but it's better than heat exhaustion. It definitely, because once you start progressing, you can progress quickly from heat exhaustion to heat stroke. So if you can get the core temperature down, which is what we're ultimately trying to do, then it works. So take an ice bath. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds awful, but yeah, it's good stuff. So then yeah, you, know, you go from the heat cramps and you get a heat exhaustion where you're just, you're, you're, you're exhausted. I mean, you're just, you're falling down. You can't, maybe your uh, height, uh, your uh, hand eye coordination is not what it's supposed to be. Uh, and you're maybe stumbling on words like I do sometimes. I was just <laughs> going to say, wait, are, do you have heat exhaustion right now? I think I'm having a stroke. <laughs> like, I think I'm more like the stroke side. Like my words are just not coming out today. <laughs> Uh, but then, you know, you can progress into these heat strokes and these strokes, they look just like the strokes that we would see if someone was having an actual uh, injury, like a ne neurological injury. They've got the sort of speech. Maybe they can't move one side of their, their body and they look like they're having a stroke, but it's all heat related. And if you get them cooled off, you get them um, their core temperature back down. The stroke symptoms go away. So weird. So, I mean, what can we do like about this? I mean. Early recognition is a huge part, right? Yes. Uh, so we need to recognize, hey, we got to get them in the shade. We got to get some water in them. We got to make sure that they cool down just a little bit. Because once we get to heat exhaustion and in the way further heat stroke, I mean, how do we how do we help with that in the field without big ice baths and other things? So I would look at it, you know, if we had some water, we could get them to a creek water or we could get them into the lake, things like that. Maybe we just take our some extra water and we start pouring on there, pouring on top of their head. Cause that's where we, a lot of the heat exchange happens at the top of our head. So if we can get them uh, cool down that way, pouring water on them uh, and just really just let them relax and start letting them drink as much water in, as they can until they start peeing. All right. That makes sense. Yeah. Cause I, I think uh, we, I've seen heat exhaustion a bunch of times at, at training events and um, just, you know, going out gun training, stuff like that. It's pretty common, especially when I was just in misery. Uh, and then, I, I mean Missouri, but I said Missouri. It's kind of the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody's from there, they're gonna get, we're gonna get some hate mail on that one. It's so hot there; it's not my fault. <laughs> and you, know, once you've been exposed to these types of injuries, you're more susceptible for them. You know, if you've had a heat exhaustion, heat stroke in the past, then you've got to be super cautious about because you're you're more likely to uh, have those problems, and especially if you've got some health problems, you know, high blood pressure, diabetes you've got some other kind of heart problems, it's just going to increase your risk to have these types of incidences. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, just keep out of the heat as much as possible. And early recognition is huge for that one. Yes. So I'm walking, I've been doing a lot of hiking lately. Um, just testing out some packs and stuff is giving me, giving me a good excuse to get out in, in nature. I think in the, I've got about 16 miles in the last, I don't know, 12, 13 days. I felt for sure you were chasing a pretty woman. Well, no, no, no. She was actually, she was busy. So <laughs> I, I chase her through town. Yes, but, yes. Uh, just been getting some hiking, and this is actually really good because I, I kind of change and adjust my pack every single time I go. Like um, one time, I actually forgot a med kit, which never happens. So then, <laughs> I made sure I had the med kit, and now I think I'm going to throw a Sam Splint in my hiking pack uh, just to just to be sure. I mean, it's they're light and not very bulky at all, so I think that's pretty good. But uh, one of the big things is you, you hike 10, 15 miles back in the woods and you could get some blisters and those blisters can make it to where you're in so much pain that you have trouble or can't even walk back out. Definitely. We typically say not to pop the blisters because you do get that increased risk of infection, you know, the week later, a couple of days afterwards. But I know plenty who, of hikers who have popped them just because like, I, I couldn't walk. I couldn't get out of the woods because there was so much pressure on my ankle, pressure on my, you know, inside of my foot was blister was popping up that I had to pop it. 
and did, so I could, so I was able to get out of the wood. So I would typically try to encourage people not to pop the blister, to try to put some padding, maybe use some four by four or some cling to try to pad around it uh, and make it like a little donut around it, kind of help cushion it. But there may be times, honestly, where you have to pop it and you just know that you're going to have to clean it really good with, you know, maybe some triple antibiotic ointment, some iodine, betadine solution, and just really keep after it, making sure it stays clean. Now, personally, while it does give a little bit of relief when you pop it, it always hurts so much worse when I pop my blisters like the day after. Yes. It is so painful when I pop them. I usually don't pop my blisters. I just kind of leave them as long as I can walk with them and, and do whatever. I leave them just because it, it, it saves me a lot of pain down the road. Definitely. Like the little mold skin that you can buy. Yeah. Um, that works really well for blisters, things like that. Um, if I don't have any, then like I was saying, take a four by four, kind of roll it up into a roll and then make a donut around the blister and secure it that way. That way it kind of gives some cushion so it's not pressing onto the blister, kind of push it on to the four by four galls and then kind of use it that way. And like I said, I try not to pop them. I may be a certain situation where you have to, but try not to just because they can be painful and just, you're just asking for infection. Yeah, for sure. Um, any... I, I guess that's pretty much all on blisters. Uh, don't pop them if you don't have to. Isolate them as much as you can and, and get the heck out of there. Yeah, I mean, just thinking about your footwear. I know footwear seems to be a big reason why you get those blisters. You're making sure that your, your shoes fit properly, that they're nice and tight on your foot, and uh, that you've kind of broken them in before you go onto the trail. I wouldn't buy a new pair of boots and then just go straight and do four or five miles on the trail. Uh, so just thinking about you know your gear having a good quality set of boots uh, to hike in. Yeah. I'm actually wearing brand new shoes to the airport tomorrow morning and I'm pretty nervous about it. Yeah. Nice. Good job. It's going to be a picture uh, of Instagram, this big old fat blister on your heel. Exactly. I'll post it in civilian medical and be like, what do I do? Yes. <laughs> 24 and you'll find out. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> All right. So drowning. This, this is terrifying to me. Um, it, it's just one of the things that I kind of fear the most. I, I'm a pretty good swimmer, but you know, not, not that great, but I mean, people can drown in, in very little water, just kind of depending on what's going on. What, what'd you want to talk about here? Yeah. So drowning scares the crap out of me. Um, we've actually had two drownings uh, near me uh, within uh, the last week of my, my agency's had, we had a small child and then we had a, a young adult drown. So it happens. Um, we live next to a lake. People are jumping off the rock into the water. They're not paying attention to their kids, things like that. So it happens. And I want to talk about a couple, couple of things. One is if a life vest. Absolutely. You, know, you should have a life vest on your kids. You know, if they're they're young, they're in the water playing, please put a life vest on them because they'll step off and they're under the water and you cannot find them. Uh, especially like where we're at, the lakes are, are dark. So you can be just a few feet in the water and you can't see. So small kid goes under the water it's super difficult to find them. And the time you do, uh, it's probably too late. So kids should have life vests. Um, and if you're not the strongest swimmer, then you should probably have a life vest on you too, or some kind of flotation device. But you, you got to be careful with that kind of thing. And two, we talk about CPR, cardiac arrest, and this kind of, especially cold water drownings, you have a better chance getting that person back. If you do a victim that has drowned in the water, you pull them out. Absolutely. You should be starting chest compressions. Um, probably need to think about doing a mouth to mouth or like mouth to barrier device. This is not a time that uh, I typically discourage people from doing mouth to mouth because that's gross. And they're again, if Ivanka Trump or something like that need a mouth to mouth, I'm all about it. But other than that, um, no, like that's gross. Like vomit comes up, things like that. But the reason why this person their heart quit beating is because of a respiratory problem. They drown. So if you can get, you've got to get some airflow or get some oxygenation back into their lungs and hopefully you can get them back. And we typically work these patients back until we get their core temperature back to a normal reading. So maybe they're in, you know, it's a cold water drowning. They're in 80 degree water, not like a 70 degree water. And, uh, you know, we're going to pull them out and we're going to work them and they could be under the water for, 15, 20 minutes, and we're still going to try to pull them out of the water and, and start working them. Uh, but you got to be careful. Like Kenneth and I were at the beach 
my little boy was probably two or three years old at the time. We're in the kiddie pool. Kenneth and I are both sitting in the kiddie pool, like Gage is playing in the water. Like we're being responsible parents. And we looked away literally for a second and Gage stepped off and was, I remember his eyes like being underwater looking up at me. And I was like, Oh crap. And like, I jerked him out of the water and like, a moment of panic and he was completely fine, but like his big old brown eyes were just looking at me up under the water and there was nothing he could do it was under the water. And it took literally a split second for Kenneth and I not paying attention to them. And he was in the water. It's crazy. That's crazy. But yeah, that that's definitely a big fear. And I mean, there's things we can do to, as long as they're not under too long. Um, this is what, one that we definitely have uh, the ability to make a difference on. Yeah. So like I said, mouth to mouth and I said, I probably, it's just my personal decision. On a kid, I have a better chance of doing mouth to mouth with them. Um, I've done mouth to mouth on a child because I, I didn't have a barrier device, and that's what I feel like a child needed. But an adult, I'm just going to just do chest compressions. I'm like, hey, does someone have a CPR shield, a BVM? Go to my truck. I have plenty. Go get those. Um, so you know, they probably do need some kind of respiratory help with these these drownings. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, that's uh, that's going to move us through the common wilderness emergencies. If you have extra stuff, uh, send it to our Facebook page. And if you have ideas for future shows, send it to the Facebook page as well or just the website as well, firearmsradio.tv. And uh, you can find Civilian Medical Podcast on there. And we talk about products every week. And I actually really like the one you wanted to talk about today. What is it? Yeah, so we were talking about wilderness emergencies. And I feel like this is a good one. It's my small medical bag and it's the supplies only. So it doesn't come in a bag. It doesn't, uh, it, it comes in a Ziploc bag. It doesn't come in like a nylon bag and all that. It comes in a Ziploc bag. It has five, five by nines, four by fours, has cling, has triangle bandages. So it has all those basic bandaging supplies that we were just talking about that you could make a splint with, that you could stop some minor bleeding with. You could either improvise a tourniquet if you really needed two of those triangle bandages because it has scissors in there. So you could improvise a, a, a tourniquet there. Not the ideal situation, but you could. Um, so it has those basic supplies in there. And then it's got uh, some medical tape that we help sec secure. Maybe we were improvising a splint. We can tape uh, the, the wood to the arm or the leg, things like that. And then it's got some medicines in there too. So it has the Tylenol, ibuprofen, and aspirin. So we can start helping with pain management. Also has some Benadryl in there in case someone has allergic reaction on the trail. And then um, also has a uh, bite and sting pads. So it kind of helps with those little minor um, like ant bites, things like that. Has some alcohol wipes so we can keep uh, the wound clean. And then has some band-aids and some butterfly uh, bandages in there too. So I feel like for an outdoors person, this is something that's in a Ziploc bag that's not gonna get wet. You can throw it in your, your day pack and you have a lot of supplies that could get you by for the next few hours or however much time until first responders get there. Absolutely. And $14.99. Just the, the price is amazing too. And with free shipping. Even better. Even better. Even better. And that's at Medical Gear Outfitters. You can use coupon code civilian medical uh, to save money. And honestly, I don't even know why you're not buying all your med gear from Medical Gear Outfitters. It's where I get all mine. In fact, I just got some of these. Uh, I got one or two of the small kits. And uh, what was the other one? The boo boo kit? Or Yes, the boo boo kit. Yeah. Love that one. Actually, yeah, the boo boo kit is really cool. Like it's got a lot of little small, like different kind of band-aids in it some really cool bandagings uh, it's got like wings and it's got all kind of cool stuff in there yeah that, i love that one and some of the, the medicine as well which is good stuff i believe in that one right yes okay good yep i, I thought i misspoke for a second but yeah go check it out medicalgearoutfitters.com is the place you can go and that's skinny medics store and small business so not only you're supporting a small business owner but you're supporting the co-host of this show and y'all know how much we like him I appreciate it. That way I don't have to go and like work at McDonald's, things like that. So I can, I can you get would, the pull. You, you would work at Chick-fil-A. Let's be honest. Yeah, you, I would. I would rather work at Chick-fil-A. Like, I'm not a Popeye's fan. I, I'm a, I'm on the Chick-fil-A team. You're just so nice. And they're always so nice at Chick-fil-A. My pleasure. Like, I, I like, I like for them to say that. Like I want a milkshake. My pleasure. Thank I you. Glad I can serve you. Awesome. Sweet. <laughs> so great. I love it. All right, man. That's going to do it. Uh, any, any wrap ups before we go? The only thing I was thinking about, it just hit me that we didn't add in the notes, was about like stings uh, for like a bee sting. Let's do it. We'll do it right now. So, yeah, I was like, we'll just add on a little bonus time for them. So, exactly. if someone gets stung by a bee, uh, you want to take a look at it and see if the stinger is still in the skin. 
and you want to take a credit card and or your ID or something like that and kind of swipe at it, you don't want to take a pair of tweezers because if you squeeze it, you can actually still uh, pump the venom in there. If you look at it closely, you can still see it. Sometimes they're just still pumping, uh, they're pulsating. So you want to try to take it and uh, swipe and kind of rub it out of the stinger to kind of get it loose from the person. Then you can put ice pack, things like that on there. But uh, this tip is just to use a credit card or something like that and swipe the stinger out. Yep. And, you know, that Benadryl will do great for that as well. And that in that small kit supply. Yes, exactly. You've got Benadryl in there ready to go. It is a tablet form, um, so it's going to work fairly well. If you've got yeah. the liquid form, that works better. Uh, the liquid Benadryl gets in the system faster. It just doesn't stay in the system very long. So, uh, But Benadryl quick and ask if they're highly allergic to them and if, and if they have an EpiPen. Perfect. All right. That'll do for this week. Again, if there's anything you'd like to hear about specifically, guests that you would like to hear about on the show, uh, let us know on our uh, Facebook page or the website, firearmsradio.tv. And uh, Skinny Medic, uh, I'll see you next week. Yes, sir. Find us and subscribe at civmedical.com. <laughs>